So it's 4 p.m. Friday. Hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Backyard Beekeeping, episode number 238. I'm Frederick Dunn, and this is the way to be. Today's Friday, December the 29th, last Friday of the year. That's right. New Year's is coming right up. 36 degrees Fahrenheit outside and uh, 81% relative humidity, no rain, low wind, Great day all together. And look, some people already knew that tonight was going to happen. So I'm glad you guys are here at Lambrook Farm, Wildwoods, Honeybee Farm, and Ross. Ross, thank you for sending me the link. For those of you who don't know, Ross does my technical drawings that you find on my website, thewaytobe.org. And you look at prints, that's Ross. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, I just glad that you're here. So what I'm going to do, you can put questions in the comment section. So I will check the chat from time to time. And uh, so what I'm going to do is answer some of the questions. We don't want to let the people down that submitted questions during the past week. So let's jump right into those. So we're going to follow kind of the same format. The difference is you can talk over there to each other and uh, post your questions. I'll check in with you. But I want to start out with question number one. And uh, this is from Ron, who lives in Lyon, Michigan. And it says, Fred, I'm looking into building long laying horizontal hives, been studying your design. And I was thinking if the frames ran lengthwise with a hive body instead of across, would that allow easier cluster travel in winter? I was just thinking that if a feral colony took up residence in a horizontal log, that uh, they would build the comb lengthwise. What are your thoughts? These are my thoughts while we're all live today. <clears throat> the bees do tend to build comb, particularly when there's a horizontal space. And uh, they run it lengthwise, whatever the long axis of the space is. How do we know that? We look at the ripouts, by the way, that are being done by people like Jeff Horchop, which is Mr. Ed, Randy McCaffrey, which is Dirt Rooster. By the way, I'm holding his mug today. Dirt Rooster. All right, so... Yes, the comb runs that way, and it does seem like it would make sense if we had a horizontal hive, that uh, it would be an advantage to the bees if they had continuous long comb that ran the long axis. But here's the problem. We have to get into it. We have to pull the frames. That's a common thought line that comes up. But my answer to that is uh, I like to match equipment. One of the reasons that we use uh, the long Langstroth hive, for example, over the lands, which may actually outperform the Langstroth, one of the reasons we use it is because there's so much equipment already available for the Langstroth frames and things like that. So Langstroth equipment is standard. If we run it the long axis, we have to find ways to put the frames end to end and it presents some other issues. So the question is, it'd probably be easier for the bees to follow a continuous comb throughout the length of winter, but do they not you know, go frame to frame if they're actually perpendicular to the long axis of the hive? And they do. And one of the coolest ways that we see it is uh, in that ivory beehive that I started this year, which is an uh, observation hive. It's a horizontal format. Let me tell you what, they filled every frame. Everything is capped. They're using the space. So I think what's really important if you have a horizontal hive of any kind is that your bees have the ability to get through the frames and travel that distance, even though your frames are now perpendicular. Uh, and one of the ways we do that is if you're putting in waxed plastic foundation, it's very important, I think, to notch it out. So cut corners and cut a little V-notch in the middle at the top. And then that leaves the bees openings to pass through without going up and around or over the top of the frame. With the lay-ins frames, they can't go over the top. They have to go around the sides or the underside. But here's the thing. Most lay-ins frames have natural wax foundation, so the bees can go right through it. Uh, so that's easier. So a lot of people do it, you know, um, they're, they've tried to run the lengthwise, but it turns into management issues. So one of the reasons, man, this chat is zipping right along. Um, there's Becky, there's Glenn, Dave. I don't want to spend a whole bunch of time. One shoe is here, 55 degrees today. Gee, I'm sorry that the weather is so hard there. For those of you that missed the opening, it's 36 degrees Fahrenheit today which I'm actually personally kind of glad about because I need my bees to calm down, get clustered, and stop using up their resources. If you saw the video I posted just a couple of days ago, or was it even yesterday? Um, 
had to feed a colony. They ran out of their stores. There's too much activity, too much warmth, and not just a single day of warmth, which would be a benefit because they can fly and do cleansing flights and drag out their dead and things like that. But uh, they're actually um, using up their resources because we're getting warm day after warm day after warm day after warm day, which is very unusual for this part of the country, which if you don't know, I'm located in the state of Pennsylvania and it's supposed to be snowy and cold here. So if I miss someone's comment, if you've got a question, I'm going to ask others to kind of maybe point it out to me and uh, we'll see how things go. But I will answer those. And uh, we have David Miller. I served with a guy in the Navy named David Miller. Really funny, super smart dude. And uh, hit the like button, Lambrook Farm says. I wouldn't hate that. You could hit the like button. That would not make me upset one bit. Let's move along to question number two. That comes from Barry in Oakland, California. It says, I'm going to try attracting Varroa to drone brood this season with the queen isolation cage. So we've talked about that several times this past year. And this was 2023, the first year I was using queen isolation cages and then the newest queen introduction cage. Can you review the how to do and that you would do? I have a lot of drone bird comb. They built under my Valkyrie horizontal high frames. By the way, Valkyrie, that's interesting. That uh, was something that transported people to the dead or through Valhalla. I think that's Viking or Norse mythology. Anyway, do you have any favorite way of cobbling them onto a frame? I know, two questions, but super related. Um, I'm going to let you down, Barry, because when it comes to putting frames in those cages for drone production, I'm going to highly recommend those green, large cell-sized drone frames. It just makes it so easy for us to keep track of. Uh, if you can get your bees to draw out that comb, and you can keep that comb for a long time, because guess what? Uh, it's not brood that we're really working with. Remember, that's a sacrificial frame. So I would put the green drone frames in those isolation cages. And some of you might be sitting out there going, what's an isolation cage? What are you talking about? So just happen to have one on the shelf right here. This is a queen isolation cage. All it does, if we put a drone comb in this, now the question was how to cobble it together. There are ways. If you look at the way people do cutouts, they take a foundationless frame, they use rubber bands, and they put drawn comb in the frame, and then the bees work it. They glue up the edges with their, you know, their burr comb, and they match it up, and they finish it. I think it's going to look kind of rough. You could use it. You don't have to get rid of it. But to me, since once you get started with drone comb, you'll be using it over and over just to mitigate the varroa destructor mites inside your hive. So when you put it in here, it also means that the drones cannot get out of the cage once they emerge from your drone comb. What's the benefit of that? If you did not see the interview that I did with Zach Lamas, we talked about uh, the propensity for varroa destructor mites to go um, after drones. Even, you know, we know that they like to reproduce in the drone uh, pupa state, right? But they also like to go onto the bodies of drones in preference over the nurse bees. So if we can keep the drones in that cage until they're about three days old, we can not only get the mites that were on the developing pupa, we can also get drones that leave nurse bees and go onto the bodies of those young drones, pull them all out together. So the green drone frame is what I recommend. Let me look in here and see we've got a question popping in. Andrew says, Fred, how do you stay safe when treating OAV when you have a beard? Not asking for recommendations for what or other bearded people could do. Just curious about your personal methods. And that's a very good question, by the way. Um, I used to be in the military. I was in the Navy. And one of the things we had to do is be fit so that we could fit test all of our safety gear. So it doesn't matter. Uh, you notice I don't have a big, thick beard. You're right. If you had a big, thick beard and you put that face shield on the face mask to make sure that you're not breathing in that oxalic acid vapor, which is very critical, there's a there's a fit test that anybody can do. You can hold on to your filters and block them with your hands and breathe in and see if you can suck that mask up to your face without the straps around your head. If it stays, 
then you've got a good seal. If when you do that and you hold your breath there, if it leaks through, then you don't have a good seal. So you do have to really snug it up. And just like, you know, anything else, if it's personal safety equipment, you have to prove that uh, the oxalic acid won't get into your mask and, of course, defeat the filters. So that's it. My beard is pretty short. I get a good air seal with it. Uh, with scuba diving and scuba masks and stuff, we used to worry about our mustaches. That's why you see some guys with their mustache trimmed right up here by their nose. They get a good seal. Same principle. You need to get a good air seal so that uh, the stuff doesn't go in. Uh, White Smoke Honey says, how's it going, Frederick? What is the most expensive queen bee you have purchased? P.S. Go Army, beat Navy. Okay, for those that I don't, I don't think I've ever watched the Army Navy game. But if they, hey, okay, go Army, beat Navy, whatever. Um, the most expensive queen I've ever purchased is going to have to be the, you know, the Bee Weaver Queens. I bought Carniolans this year for some testing and goofing around. They were thirty-five dollars each, including shipping. Uh, the Bee Weaver Queens were. See, I don't buy those breeder queens. That's when you get into the hundreds of dollars. I'm not a bee breeder. I'm not a queen breeder. Uh, so I don't need that kind of stock. So uh, the most I've ever paid was probably for a Bee Weaver Queen. They jumped to $60 or something like that last year. And uh, then I shifted to Carniolans. But I really haven't bought that many queens overall. And uh, that's it. I you know don't spend a lot. Make my own queens. In fact, I highly recommend that if you can do it, that you requeen your own bees if you can get away with it. But I know we often end up late in the year or something like that. We need a laying queen right away. Or we want to know the genetics of a queen and you might buy one in. I like the Carniolans. They're kind of cool. So anyway, let's jump to Ren here. How does a queen bee know that she is the queen and not a worker bee? And why doesn't she engage in any activities? Well, let me tell you, Ren, the queen engages in a lot of activities. She eats, and she takes naps, and she produces eggs. And she, of course, at some point in her life, she had to fly out and mate with a bunch of drones at the local drone congregation area, a.k.a. Singles Bar. And uh, then she came back. So how does she know? She's genetically coded. So that's just it. And here's the interesting thing that I want people to think about, particularly if you're a new beekeeper. This still blows my mind a little bit. When uh, eggs are being produced inside the hive and the queen is laying her eggs, she can lay, you know, when she's laying worker eggs, those are female eggs, right? Guess who decides if that egg becomes a queen or is just a worker? The nurse bees do. How do they decide? They decide that through diet alone. Now, of course, we see a structural difference in the cell that they're developing that, you know, that new larvae in, right? So when they develop the cell and it's hanging down, that becomes a queen cell. They're making more space for it, but they're changing the final cast of the bee with the food that they're giving her. The royal jelly, the amount of it, the frequency of feeding, diet alone, and then, of course, room in the structure and the feeding sequence changes whether that's a standard worker honeybee or the queen herself that still amazes me today so it's not that the queen knows the nurse bees know and they they changed her so what are we doing here somebody says rescue swimmer jen or glenn what jen i was a rescue swimmer too at one time that's a fun job rescue and assistance detail first class swimmer rescue swimmer Diver, rescue diver, it's all fun. Anything to get you off the ship and into the ocean, that's the way to go. So welcome. Thank you for your service, by the way. And here we go. Uh, let's go down the line. Victoria, Australia, thank you for making it. I don't know what time it is there. Um, I'm glad that everybody is making it. Let me move on really quick. I don't see a question. Here's Paul. I have a tiny colony with a new autumn queen in a polynuke. I didn't have drawn comb to lay in. Any suggestions as to how I can help this little colony get through the winter? Okay, Paul, we're already in winter now. Um, here's the problem. If it were later in the year, this is what I use better comb for. In other words, if, if you've never heard of it, it's a synthetic beeswax. It's already drawn out, and it's kind of an emergency resource. 
um, if you need it for your bees because they didn't have the time as you just described to draw it out. This is what it looks like. It feels like beeswax. It looks like beeswax and the bees connect it all up. What it does is provides them with drawn comb that they use the same as beeswax, but um, they don't have the demand of temperature, for example, which happens late in the year. Remember, it has to be warm inside the hive for them to draw out new comb. So that's an emergency thing. It's probably too late for you if you don't have it. I keep better comb, which comes from better bee. Uh, I keep it on the shelf all the time, just in case I have some kind of emergency where I have to fortify them with drawn beeswax. And of course, it's not real beeswax, but in every practical way, it behaves like beeswax and the bees accept it. So uh, at this point, I don't know what to do. Um, do, 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 do. And here's something from Ren that says, can we replicate what nurse B, what nurse B does and feed a larva to turn it into a queen? Can we? No, I don't know that that's ever been done, actually. I don't think we've adequ adequately replicated what the metabolism of the bee produces. Remember, they have mandibular glands, the nurse bees do, they have vitelligenin, they have all of these resources that have to be metabolized that involve enzymes, and we have not replicated that to the best of my knowledge. But why would we want to? I, I really don't want to see them. I've seen them try to replace, you know, cattle, right, and make synthetic milk. It's kind of the same thing. It's very complicated. I've, you know, I wouldn't personally be that interested in it, but I'm sure somebody could get a PhD out of it. If they made that happen, it's a big deal because there's so much in, in biology that we can observe, that we can validate, we can't replicate. So there's a biochemist somewhere that maybe has a good start on that. I don't know. It would have to have value. So um, first time here to watch. Let's see. Thanks. I bought a reptile heating mat and put under the nuke to see if that will help. Oh, this is to warm it up. Okay. Uh, let's see. Carmine. Hey, Fred. Thanks for all of your knowledge and work producing videos. Do you have a video on making comb honey? I do. I have, uh, if you just go to my YouTube channel, which is Frederick Dunn, up in the right hand, uh, there's a little search area with a little magnifying glass next to it. Type in Ross Rounds or type in Comb Honey. And it will show a couple of different methods start to finish from loading it up, putting the cassettes in, putting it on the hive, and of course, harvesting, processing, and putting it in packaging. So it is there. And I realize it's a lot to go through and it's hard to find because there are over a thousand videos on my YouTube channel. And uh, this is a quick search. So if you don't find it right away, you know, type in something else, comb honey, you know, uh, chunk honey, and of course, Ross rounds. And then the other one that we did was we just cut comb honey. So it was foundationless frames and uh, we cut it and put it in containers two by four. And we also had the four by four cutters, which by the way, I'm glad you mentioned that because if we're talking about comb honey. I read an article uh, I think it was in the American Bee Journal. So I'm just going to share it with you now because you might be sitting there, holidays are coming up, and you might be trying to feed someone comb honey. Rusty Burlow. I don't know her. I read the article. It was pretty darn interesting. Uh, she said, never eat comb honey by itself and don't ask other people to eat comb honey by itself. And I thought, well, what a bossy, you know, person. Anyway, what she wanted us to do is cut the comb honey out. So cut the little chunk. Put that on a piece of cheese, cheese of your choice. Put that on a cracker. Eat the comb honey on cheese and a cracker together, and you will never eat comb honey by itself again. And I have to tell you, that actually is a very good thing. And if I had not read the article and given it the time of day to find out why she's saying you're eating comb honey wrong, I would not have known that. So I'm sharing that with all of you right now. If you're going to eat comb honey, eat the wax and everything. If it's part of the cheese you like, the cracker you like, it's a Triscuit. I don't know what kind of track cracker you eat, but uh, apparently that combination is unbeatable. And for those of you who are trying to sell your comb honey, that is the instruction that you should also, according to Rusty Burlow, you should convey that to the person that you're hoping to sell your comb honey to. And you will sell out. 
uh, people love it. There's a resurgence for it. You can't fake it. It's all made by bees, start to finish. So good to go. Let's see what else is here. May I ask, this is from Malcolm. This is, may I ask where you have bought your Carniolan Queens from and why you chose this breeder? Because I know you do a lot of research. I'm gonna let you down, Malcolm. What did I do? They were on sale at the end of the year. And keep in mind, the reason I bought the Carniolan, um, at first I went to Better Bee to see if they had Carniolans because they were listed, but they were out. Then I went to Man Lake and I went through Man Lake and just bought, you know, $35 Carniolans. I did not do diddly for research. And here's why I planned to play with them. So I was ready to let them go 100%. Uh, the reason was I was using them to test honeybee behavior to their pheromones, unfamiliar queen and everything else. Those of you who are going to the North American Honeybee Expo next week, and if you attend my presentation, you're going to learn all about what I did with those Carniolans. And uh, I chose them because they're cold weather hardy. You know, they keep a small cluster in winter. But uh, I just went straight through Man Lake. So I'm just guessing if they came from Man Lake, they actually came from California, which means uh, Oliveris maybe family bred them. They're like the biggest breeders in California. And I'm just going to guess that's where they came from. But it was, you know, brokered through Man Lake. They were inexpensive. $35 or something with shipping. Uh, so somebody says here, what kind of cheese? Okay, that's personal preference. I don't know what kind of cheese, you know, you like. You definitely don't want to put it on a cheese that you personally wouldn't eat, you know, on a cracker. So cheese on a cracker, you're going to have to experiment. Uh, I did a interview with a honey sommelier, and that's a fancy word for somebody who knows everything about the nuances of tasting honey and that interview is on my uh, website, thewaytobe.org, and there's a page marked Interviews you can watch. And uh, La Carnini is her name, and uh, you'll learn about, she talks about cheese as well in combination with clear, cleansing the palate when tasting uh, honey and things like that. So it's all very interesting stuff. Uh, let's see, it says here, almost a gardener and a beekeeper. When are you going to post your plans for the observation hive that Ricky built you. Now, Ricky, I don't, I don't think I'm posting the plans. Eventually, I might, but here's the problem. Uh, I just got that from Hive Life last year. Ricky, if you don't know who that is, that's Horizontal Bees. And uh, he was nice enough. I spec'd it out. I sent him my, my drawings, so my technical sketches or whatever you want to call them. He built it. Here's what I don't do. I don't post the plans for something that hasn't proven itself. So um, I'm waiting on that. There are, um, I show examples of how to set up observation hives and things like that. Uh, I have not, you know, put the plans out there. So I don't know if he has the plans anymore. These were drawings. So I have a tendency to just sketch everything out, send it to somebody and, hey, can you build this for me kind of thing. And uh, so they're not, you know, ready for print. It's not a PDF file or something like that, but it's pretty straightforward. Um, so no, I, I don't have a timeline for that, but I want to make sure it proves itself first. It has things on it that are unnecessary for observation hives for bee survival because they facilitate my observation of the bees. I make recordings of the honey bees. So they have acoustic, uh, chambers built into them just so I can record bees at different times of the year, sounds that they're making day, night, uh, prior to swarming, after swarming, all of these things are, I'm sure there are other people doing similar recordings and I'm getting the highest quality recordings that I can possibly get. I invested in audio gear to do that and then designed an observation hive specifically. Big surprise for observation number one, tempered glass. And then of course, cavities within the hive top and bottom so I can record bees. So, and introduce queens if I needed to without opening the whole hive. So once it's proven and once it's consistent and, I, and I'm happy with it and I'm not making changes, that's when you could probably expect to see observation hive drawings online. So let's see what else we have here. Uh, I'm going to move into another question that I already have, so we're not letting people down. Uh, isolation cage, where he did that. Let's go question number three here. 
And question number three comes from Dona and Havdi Gras, Havdi Gras, Maryland. I've heard you talk about the queen excluder cages and now the queen introduction cage from Better Bee. I have a couple of single queen excluder cages and will be using them to place my green drone frames in for additional IPM, integrated pest management. And I like the idea of having the queen introduction cage on hand for swarms and having a place to sash a queen if needed. When I went to purchase that cage, I noticed that there is now a double frame queen excluder cage. When and what? You use that for. Thanks for all the experiences and so on. Okay, the double cage, those are available too. Um, that's if you need to contain your queen longer. Remember, your queen can lay 1,500 to 2,000. There's a lot of uh, information about how many eggs a day a queen can lay. So if you're going to keep her on a frame in the queen cage for an extended period of time, you have the option. Single, deep frame. They also have a medium cage. And then now they have the double. So, oh, I do have it. This is the double. So see how big it is? Now here's the problem with it too. It's gonna to take up three spaces. You're gonna be pulling three frames out of your hive to accommodate your double. But here's the thing. You can leave a queen in here much longer without losing production. So if you needed to isolate your queen, pull her out of a hive while you get them you know, broodless so that you can do a treatment or you get them all open so that no varro destructor mites are hidden under caps, uh, you can keep her, you know, away much longer and not lose production because now we have over 3,000 uh, bees per side of each frame. So just do the math. That's what that's for. If you're going to keep the queen sequestered longer in that cage. And by the way, I did reach out to Dr. Peck at Better Bee, and I wanted to know if they're going to have these cages at the North American Honey Bee Expo. He said they will. So I'm buying some while I'm there. So don't get yours. If you're going to that expo, don't get yours until I get mine. That's Those are rules to live by. So, um, yeah, that's it. The reason that I do that or would do that is if I'm caging the queen longer. If we put her in a single cage, usually that's just to make sure, how do I use it? So let's just get into that. The single cage, how many of you have caught a swarm as I have only to see it depart a couple of days later? I also, I do unorthodox things. I realize in the way I hive a swarm, I uh, like to set them in a net in front of the hive and they walk in the entrance. Guess what I get to do when they do that? I get to collect the queen if I wanted to. So the queen will walk up. It's a white cotton uh, butterfly net. It's huge. It's oversized. And when they're all going up and some of the scouts have gone into that uh, hive, by the time the queen starts to move in there, she'll move across the cotton fabric. And I have the option. I can watch her to see that she went in. Of course, we'll see the bee behavior once she's in there because they're all going to fan their nasonox and offs glands. And they're going to let us know that they're happy that she's in there. Um, but we also have the opportunity to collect that queen and we could put her in one of these queen isolation cages, put that inside the hive where we're freshly hiving a swarm and now they're stuck in there. Because if they change their minds and they decide they don't like the hive that you've provided for them, they could leave. But they can't leave without their queen. So if she's on that frame and you keep her there until she's laying eggs, this gives you lots of opportunity. Number one, she can't get away. You're not going to lose that swarm. You're not going to go out two days later expecting to see this robust swarm of bees working their hineys off. Instead, you look at the hive and you see it's empty and there's nothing going on. They left. So if she's in the cage, they can't leave. Now, we can also see what kind of brood pattern she's capable of. We can see how healthy and productive the queen is. So while she's in that cage on that frame, we see her egg pattern. We see them going from eggs to, of course, larvae and then the larvae being fed by the bees who can go through those cage bars. And then we get a really good assessment on the queen. If you don't like her and she's not very productive, you don't have to keep her. And you don't have to lose all those bees either because now you can just remove the queen and bring another one in and replace them. And then that is where you can also use the queen isolation cage or guess what? Because it's an unrelated queen that maybe you spent money for, brought her in through the mail, and then you put her in a queen introduction cage, which means now the other bees can't get to her and hurt her. So that's another thing I'm going to talk to Dr. Peck about uh, when I get to the conference. And that's because we have a slight difference in method on that queen isolation cage. 
because you can put brood in that. And if it comes from that queen, uh, of course, there's brood developing, but we need nurse bees to attend to the brood. So if you introduce a queen with capped brood, um, I think that it's probably okay to have new nurse bees in there with her because they warm the brood and everything else. Well, Better Bee says that they don't want any bees inside that frame, even though there's brood that's capped with your new queen. And then they emerge and they think that they'll gather over the cage and warm them that way. I think it's better to have the bees on the comb itself. So we're going to have that discussion. Now I'm going to do an interview with Dr. Peck. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about. There might be no wrong way. Uh, so, but these are opportunities to assess queens without having to track them down throughout a new hive and see if they're as good as we want them to be. And then, of course, they're accepted by the resident bees if it's if you're introducing. But if you trapped a swarm, they're going to be anchored once there's eggs that hatch and there's open larvae and they're feeding them. Now we pull the frame out, put it in the hive. The queen is free to go. They're not leaving. They've got their anchor babies right there. So it's good to go. Uh, did that. What else? Let me see what's going on. Papa Z's bees. You said you were going back to using the flow hive roof with double bubble over wintered and double bubble in the gable and cover only the BSD's products. Honey, any thoughts? Yes, for the flow hive gable roofs. Um, I just put double bubble in those. I was replacing them in the past with Lysen and um, BMAX insulated covers. And that's because I wanted to keep that top feeder shim insulated. The other thing was the flow hives did not have room under the gabled roof because they go straight into an inner cover. And then, of course, there's the super right there. There's no room for a, a big feeder. Like you couldn't put a rapid round in there. You couldn't put a jar in there unless it was really short. And so I wanted feeder space. So instead, I did make a video about this. So modifying your flow hive for feeder space up above. So last year, I think it was last winter, was my first winter with double bubble. Worked really well. So I just glued double bubble into the interior surfaces of those gabled roofs. I bought an extra. Uh, flow super. So it's just, it's not the expensive super with the flow frames in it. So it's like a brood box. In fact, that's probably what it is. Brood box, not the super. It's just an empty box deep. So I cut two inches off the bottom of it and I left the top. Now I created a medium super out of that. And now I have a feeder shim that I cut off the bottom and I put that up on top and I married that to the inner cover. So I glued that two inch feeder shim right onto the inner cover and I lined that with double bubble. So now it, it looks like a flow high with the gabled roof and everything where before I took all the gabled roofs off, had the insulated covers because there was no room for feeding and it wasn't insulated. So now I have both and that works. So there's a video on that. If you want to look it up and double bubble is something I'm so glad to be using now because I find a new use for it almost weekly, monthly, whatever. Okay, um, Orlando, I hope I'm not missing something. So I, I am going back to the flow. If it's a flow hive, it gets its gabled roof back. Those things are expensive. I'm glad to be using them. Um, so let's see. Orlando says, hello, Mr. Dunn. Can you know how the queen lay worker or drone? I heard that the queen gets the torso squeezed. And we can call the small cells worker, the bigger cells drone. Not so, okay. Queens, by the way, um, inspect the cells. So they're looking at cells when they're laying drones. When this is a healthy queen and she's in full production and the colony is healthy and everything else. We're not talking about laying workers, just the queen. Uh, the queen lays her eggs for drones in the larger cells. She instinctively does that. The queen controls whether or not she fertilizes the egg that's on its way out. So she has a spermatheca. The spermatheca contains the sperm. That's what's going to create the worker bee when the egg is on its way out. And she just withholds that, withholds that when she's laying an egg that's only going to be haploid. So it's going to be a drone. And she does that in the larger drone cells. And uh, so the queen decides it's just something that she naturally does by feel. And if there aren't drone cells, she could, in theory, lay an egg in a worker cell. 
Now here's where the nurse bees kick in because they actually can control, number one, whether the queen's egg survives wherever she puts it. They control the genetics to some degree because it's called policing. So if you look that up, nurse bees go around if they find a couple of things wrong potentially with an egg that's laid by the queen. Uh, one could be that whatever that egg is um, might be too genetically close to the bees. So for example, if the queen somehow mated with a drone that she produced, then the bees would police up those eggs and consume them. If she puts a drone egg where a worker egg should be, the same thing can occur. The bees can scent that, the nurse bees do, they scent the pheromone, and then they'll consume the egg and remove it. So there's policing that goes on all the time. So really the workers, the nurse bees, are kind of in charge of what goes on. But instinctively, the queen produces her eggs and places them in the large drone cells if they're drones, unfertilized eggs, right? So, and I think Brian's here. I saw something. Castle Hives. Hey, Brian. So he's here. And I see a lot of familiar icons because I don't know what your faces look like, a lot of you. And uh, so anyway, what do we have? Do you know the ingredients in honey robber? Is it all natural ingredients? Also, do you use it to clear supers? I don't. So that's from Dominican Beekeeper. Honey robber, what we know is in there. So there's, I thought I had some of that spray around here, but there's bee gone, done off. There's all kinds of sprays that the bees do not like, and it's supposed to drive them out. You use a fume board. It has to be a nice hot day for that to work. Uh, so that, of course, becomes volatile, goes into the air. Bees don't like it, and they move out. I've never had good luck with fume boards. Uh, if you want to see a funny video, look at Cayman Reynolds' video where he used an electric fume board that had a little fan built into it and he sprayed the you know the bee away or whatever it's called bee robber there's a lot of different uh, trade names out there but um for me a straight bee escape is my number one choice for getting bees out of a super now i realize you have to lift the super to do it you're going to be lifting that super anyway and the amount of bees that are in there doesn't really change the weight so the bee escapes that come from Cirocell, it's called the Great Escape, and they come in an eight frame or a 10 frame standard lang, and uh, that clears a beehive uh, perfectly for me because there's just a few bees left in there at the end of the year, and I have a whole pile of them, and uh, that's just so I go through, you know, the afternoon before I need to get the super off, I put all those bee escapes on, and then the following day I come back out about the same time and uh, pull the honey supers off. And then I take those escape boards off and I just lean them on the landing board because the underside is covered in beads and I let them all walk back in. So the day after that, then I collect the uh, bee escapes. That's why I need so many of them because you can't go hive to hive to hive where you can with the fume boards if they worked the way they're supposed to. I just haven't, I tried it. I have a lot of fume boards, unfortunately. And uh, I tried it. It didn't work the way it was supposed to. Not to quote Cayman Reynolds, but I think he said one of them smelled like cheese vomit or something, whatever the smell was. It was not pleasant. I don't want to add the smells. So I'm just going to let this out. Anyway, Carmen says, Fred just added some hive live fondant as you did due to the bees consuming a lot of their honey. This warm weather in New York City is making it tough for them as they are going out and are very active. That's true. Um, and that's why I did that video this past week or yesterday, whenever it was. Um, I thought I need to get the word out because it is remarkable how quickly when the bees are active, they can consume the resources that they have in the hive that seemed like more than enough. But if they're flying, we see them bringing in pollen. Some people said they were seeing dandelions blooming. I don't know what's going on. And uh, they got so active that one of the bees, one of the colonies was in jeopardy. You see a big pile of dead bees on the landing board. Uh, they're trying to move and they're just dying out. And uh, it's not you know, one of the first instinctive things you would say is that, well, you must have had really high varroa mites. You got a varroa bomb going on. No, they consume their resources. And another thing that they were doing is they were uh, unpacking all of their pollen. So there's pollen all over the bottom. And the bees that are really starving go after the pollen because it has nectar in it. It has honey in it. 
they're trying to glean resources. So they used everything up. If I didn't have that um, Hive Live, and somebody else told me that there's another uh, fondant pack out there that uh, Strong Microbials put out fondant packs. I didn't even know that. So again, next week is going to be fantastic. Strong Microbials, I'm going to be talking to those people about their fondant packs. I didn't even know they were out there. Basically, Hive Alive was the one that it's working for so many people that it's just become kind of the fondant pack. But as always, you know, my mind is open. I'm interested in seeing what other people are producing and what it's composed of. I know it does have uh, high fructose corn syrup. I did look at the ingredients, but it also has the strong microbials uh, DFM, the direct fed microbials, which can act on industrial agricultural pesticides and help your bees break them down so they don't impact them. So if you guys, if any of you are going to uh, the conference next week, check in with strong microbials too. We'll check in with all these people as many as we can, but they've got a new fondant. So, and I'm really glad because it was one of the viewers that said, Hey, what about, you know, strong microbials fondant packs? Didn't even know they existed. That's why this interaction is so valuable. So Shannon says, let's see. Shannon Lyons, I added Hive Alive fondant to my hives two weeks ago, even though they had a full super above the brood box. They were consuming the fondant like crazy. I'll get my order from North American Honeybee Expo just in time. And by the way, that's a big deal. Uh, getting them through the expo because that stuff's heavy. And so you'll save money. I think they have specials going on and it's super heavy stuff. Now, Castle Hive says super fuel. What is that, Brian? Tell me more. Super fuel. Is that, see, like, I mean, strong microbials, there are rockets on their packet and it says, you know, so maybe that's, is it called super fuel? Anyway, we're going to learn about it. I don't know enough to share about it here other than Always keep your eyes open for new stuff. You never know what's out there. And uh, Brian ordered a 40-pound box. Well, thanks for sharing, Brian, that you have everything in the world in beekeeping and that we don't. Way to go. Thanks. I didn't I didn't get that information from you, by the way. So thanks a bunch. All right, moving on. Have you ever heard that once the bees fly in fall and winter, that they are no longer winter bees, so to speak, that they start to age very quickly. That's from Dwayne. And let me explain the winter bees, the fat bodied winter bees, which by the way, some entomologists want to call that a completely different cast because they're physiologically different. They have fat cells and storage capability in their heads, their thorax, their abdomen. They're much heavier. Can you look at them and tell? No, you can't. And here's the thing. Uh, Dwayne says once they fly, well, they don't fly. They never fly. They don't leave the hive. By the time they do, they're at the end of their life. So the fat-bodied winter bees, and some people even argue about this. These are the entomologists. These are the smart people, not the backyard people like me. But these are the entomologists that are thinking that it should be a different cast, and here's why. Uh, because their function is so unique and that we also shouldn't be calling them winter bees. We should actually call them dearth bees. So in other words, the, again, the queen makes the decision. And this is interesting, too, because we don't know it all about this. How are the fat-bodied winter bees made? In other words, because they're physiologically different, something goes on. So when they're making them, we want them to have prime nutrition. But somehow they know when there is uh, a leaning out of the environmental resources. So floral, the nectar, everything is starting to wane away. And so then what happens is uh, they start to produce these fat-bodied winter bees while their resources are plentiful. And what they're capable of doing is in the absence of uh, resources like stored pollen, they use what's stored in their bodies to metabolize and feed that critical winter brood. So these fat bodied winter bees are nurse bees of a different kind that really give up their own body resources and use themselves up to guarantee that this colony survives a dearth. And so this also happens in winter. That's why they ended up being called the fat-bodied winter nurse bees. But actually, they're kind of dearth bees because there's evidence that they also do it in periods of just uh, famine, you know, when the bees can't get what they need. So it's very interesting stuff. And uh, yes, by the time they actually do go out, they're at the end of their life. And I would expect that they would expire pretty quick. They're 
They're physiologically different from the standard nurse bee, standard worker bee. Okay, so what else are we doing? Uh, Kia says these is these using fume boards, but bought a few escape boards. So you guys, you guys keep talking. I'm going to go over here to question number four. This is from Ellen. Very early spring last year, nothing was blooming, but my bees were bringing in tan colored pollen. I spent time searching the internet and found sites showing and telling that bees will collect pollen from different types of animal feed, chicken, cattle, etc. That's true. In a time when they don't have the resources they need, it seems textural. Like they'll even go after the chalk dust that uh, soccer fields are marked with. So I don't know if they're using flour for that. You know, I don't, different parts of the world, they probably use different things. But uh, they even go for fine sawdust in your wood shop. And uh, they'll be in your chicken feed. All my chicken feeders are inside the buildings, right? And so there's a certain dust that builds up at the bottom of the chicken feeders. And uh, bees go in there. So the bees go into the chicken coop and roll around in that and fly out with their corbicula, having little chicken feed balls. So they're not pollen balls. They're not, you know, it's not pollen. But here's what happens. They collect this stuff that's nonsense and they get scolded and this is very interesting because uh i was talking with uh, a phd from usc in california we talked about bee communication and the bees that were coming home with things that the nurse bees did not want keep in mind that when they bring pollen in the forager does this little fancy waggle dance to brag about what they found out in the environment and while they're doing the waggle dance other bees pay attention they also stick their tongues out their antennae are out and they're you know, they're doing the waggle dance and they're going to the right and then they waggle a little bit and they go to the left and they waggle a little bit. So those that are paying attention, they also sample what they're bringing in. And you see this bee get rejected. Why? Because you have sawdust on your legs. So that bee goes and tucks that sawdust into a cell. And uh, the other bees don't follow suit. They don't go after it. So in other words, the bees that are looking at foragers coming in to go and forage for more. So you don't see, you know, then 100 bees going to the chicken feeder to get a bunch of, you know, corn powder. So instead, uh, they get rejected inside the hive. So it's not nutritious to the bees. Now, on the flip side of that, if they find something that's really good for them, the waggle dance continues. And here's the other part that was really interesting about inside the hive communication. Uh, dancing bees getting beat. It's basically you're told to shut up. So when the dancer is there and you've got you know, dust from the football game, or you've got, you know, powder from somebody's fun woodworking shop, uh, a bee rams into the side and beeps them until they stop dancing. It just sends them off in a corner by themselves. So it's very interesting. So yes, when they're desperate, bees go after textures. So these foragers, I don't think they're very bright about it. I think they just don't want to come home empty handed. So they come home with something and uh, it's not always good for the hive and uh, they can be shut down on the dance floor and sent to the corner where they unload their corbicula. Uh, let's see. We're talking about bulbs, planting. I'm about an hour and 30 minutes from you, Jimmy West. Okay, there again, talking amongst yourselves. Okay, so we'll move on to question number five. This is from Keith, St. Louis, Missouri. With regard to your five frame nukes with a fixed bottom board. So these are five frame wooden nucleus boxes that have a fixed bottom board. In other words, it doesn't come off at all and the entrance is in the front. How well do the bees keep the floor cleaned when compared to your other nukes that have the rectangular entrances flush with the bottom of the floor of the lower hive body? And then have you done any temperature data logging plotting to compare the interior surfaces? Let's skip that for a second. So we'll talk about the um, Nuke hives. By the way, I like those and I don't like them all at the same time. Here's why. I'm changing out from those. Uh, those nucleus five frame deeps um, that, that have the entrance on the front and the bottom board is affixed. So the good of it is uh, if dead bees pile up in there, they don't block the entrance. I never had a blocked entrance, never had to clear an entrance on any of those nucleus hives that have that front entrance like that, which is well off the bottom. Uh, the bad news is you can't just lift it off and sweep off the bottom of, you know, the hive. So it's fixed. It's permanent. 
Uh, then when you pull the frames in spring, you're doing your hive inspections and things like that. The other part of the question is, are they as clean as those that have a flat bottom board with an entrance on the same plane as the entrance as the bottom board, right? Uh, yeah, they're the same. They're just as clean. Because by the time we're pulling them apart, it's spring. They're already fully active. The, the housekeeping bees are doing their thing. The undertaker bees have removed whatever dead bees were probably in there. Uh, the drawback, too, that I see with that is... Uh, moisture seeps into the front corners so i see a wet front so i suppose if it were a regular bottom board with an entrance reducer you could pull out the moisture would run right out instead of being up against that inner surface so it stays wet longer so that's a drawback so where am i headed with my nukes uh i showed in my recent video that i have the bottom board of the nuke is an enclosed bottom board and it's got a screen on the bottom so to save time and energy on my part. I bought screened bottom boards and I bought them. I think I got them from Better Be. I'm not sure. It could have been Dayton. Uh, they have screened bottom boards with the landing board. And then, of course, they're nice and deep. So, what I did then was just manufactured bottoms for those and I closed them in. The reason I did that, I have a screen, I have a solid bottom beneath that. Now I have these, they're uh, called sandwich trays. So, they're only about I don't know, four or five inches wide. And then they run almost the length of that deep uh, deep uh, nuke box, right? So I can push that in there, close up the back. Now I have a screened enclosed nuke with a tray that I can pull out to count mites. If I do an oxalic acid treatment, I can see if the mites are in there. If I have moisture dripping down in through the screen, I pull that out, it's in the tray. Those sandwich trays are so cheap inexpensive. I bought a whole pile of them from Amazon. And so I just go out with a clean one, pull the dirty one out, put the clean one in, close it up. That's where I'm headed with all of my nucleus hives that are made from wood. The five frame deep boxes will all have screen bottoms. I just don't want to get rid of you know stuff that's still usable. So I'm going to keep them around and use them up. And I'm going to transition into screen bottom boards enclosed below that with removable trays. And uh, it's looking good so far because you get passive mic control too. So the other part of the question from Keith is, have you done any temperature data logging and plotting to compare the interior temperatures of the uninsulated Bee Academy shed? Okay, well, the Bee Academy building, okay, it's a shed. Anyway, um, I don't data log that. I have uh, humidity and temp readouts in there. And I have humidity and temp readouts on every observation hive that's in there because I like to see what the variances are. I'm not data logging that. I'm just checking in on it to see what's going on. And uh, on a day when it's sunny and 39 degrees outside, sunny against that south wall of that building, I can go in there and it's 65 inside. So it is a fantastic building. What did I insulate the ceiling with, by the way? You guessed it. Double bubble. So I like that building, but I'm not, you know, I don't see a big benefit in knowing what the temperature difference is inside and out, other than when my grandson shows up, that's the first place he wants to go. Um, he wanted to go out there and look for queens when it was like 32 degrees outside. So obviously at nighttime, it has the same, it's equalized. So outside, inside, it's all the same. And then uh, the observation hives themselves run about 12 degrees warmer than the building. So, and that's with a sensor on top of the observation hive underneath, guess what? A double bubble, what I call a hot pocket. So it looks like a, it looks like a pillowcase uh, made out of this stuff. So, and it's that thin, right? 11 degrees, pretty consistent, warmer than the building that it's in. So this stuff, endless uses for it. I'm just finding new, new ways to use that all the time. So by the way, you know what? I'm really glad everyone is being so good in here. I don't see anybody labeled as a, I don't have any, what are they called? Moderators? Let me see. I'm going to add somebody as a moderator. Uh, let's see. Standard moderator, half tracks and honey. That's Keith. So watch out. Keith can now send you out. If you have problems, who else should I have as a moderator? I think one is good right now. 
But everybody's being good. I haven't had one troll, not one person making fun of the way I look or anything. I think that's great. So I have Amanda Liberty here that says, I watched a video of a beak doing an alcohol wash with the dead bees from the bottom board of a dead out. Do you think this is an effective way to diagnose if mites cause a dead out? I actually don't. And uh, well, now a dead out. Let's rethink that. Because I've washed um, dead packages, for example, that are received in the mail. If it's a dead out, let's talk about what that is. So when did that happen? Winter time. So if the mites killed the bees in winter and they were dead in spring and they're all piled inside there, yeah, but I wouldn't bother doing an alcohol wash. I think I would do the colander. I have this big stainless steel colander. This is what I like to do. And uh, so you have two of them. Let's think this through. Yep. So the stainless steel colander and then another colander underneath that, and it has the big bun coffee filters in it. Okay. So the one that holds all the bees is your colander without the coffee filter. And I like to soak them in Dawn Ultra Free and Clear dish soap, right? This is the good stuff because you can. it goes into the environment. It doesn't hurt anything. Randy Oliver, full credit, did the studies on that, and the mites released. Now, keep in mind what's happened. If the bees are dead, the mites probably released from them on their own, okay? Because it can no longer feed from a dead bee, but they would still be there, right? So if you could really clean them off the bottom board, and I'd say, yeah, you could wash them. I don't think it's going to tell us that they killed the bees unless, like, there's a huge number of them. But I would hose them off, you know, after soaking them in that, pour that into the colander, get the mites to wash off because now you can use your vegetable sprayer. I highly recommend you do this in the kitchen, not during dinner time. And you hose out with really hot water, all of your bees until it's super clean into the next colander that's got the coffee filter in it. And you'll see your mites in that. And then uh, somebody called me out on that when I did that because they said it looked like the screen that I had would not permit mites to pass through. Fair enough. So then we did another test with the question to make sure that we had mites because that one, the package that we tested, it was a Saskatras package of bees that were dead on arrival. Um, they had no mites. So we wanted to do it again. And then so we took some that had mites to make sure the mites could go through and they did. So you also want to do that test to make sure your stuff is going. But uh, yeah, that would be, I mean, if you really want to know if they had mites, sure, you can wash them because they're dead. Where do the mites go? The mites aren't going to run out of that thing on their own. They have no chance of surviving coming out of a hive in winter. And what are they going to do? Jump in the snow and wait for a snow bee doing a cleansing flight to jump onto? They, they're dead. So I think that's, yeah, that would work. So what else do we have? Uh, did you try permahives? It got the swarm to start their colony and build downward. I don't have permahives. No experience with those at all. Uh, let's go on. Do, 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 do. Okay, I'm going to go on to the next question. Oh, and Keith from St. Louis, by the way, thanks for reminding me that uh, you graduated from KHS, which is Kirkwood High School. That's where I graduated from high school. For anybody that wants to know, Kirkwood, Missouri, go Pioneers. Uh, and we talked about sports. Somebody said Army versus Navy. Let me put it in perspective for you. I was a band nerd. So that's right. I was in the marching band at Kirkwood High School. I was solo trumpet, lead trumpet, first trumpet, whatever you want to call it. Largest marching band in the state of Missouri. Thank you, Keith, for giving me a chance to toot my own horn on that. Moving on. KHS. Good old pioneers. And Webster Gross was, that was the team that we always wanted to get on Thanksgiving and get some kind of victory bell in our Learning Resource Center. Question number six comes on here, and this is from Sweating Llama is the YouTube name. Hi, Fred, just wondering what the red plastic with solar panels hanging from the tops of some hives are. Sorry if you mentioned it, and I missed it. Thanks. So that's a good question. They are noisemakers. They're solar powered. They're motion activated, and you can pick the, um, the mode. So they have four modes, so you can have them go off daytime, uh, and they can be flashing light only, flashing light and audible. So how did I pick them? I picked the ones that had the highest dB rating. So the loudest, most obnoxious noisemakers. When do they come on? They come on at night. 
Why do I have them out there? They repel pests. And I have cameras out there, and I love watching raccoons get a new hairdo, and they're surprised all of a sudden, and a noisemaker goes off. Because then when they move out, a whole bunch of them go off. Uh, and so they chase away. They don't work on skunks. Skunks are perfectly content. It seems to have a bunch of noise around them. So they start flashing. They make noises. I don't even want to hear it when I'm checking the, the sequences from the cameras. Now, so what are they for? They're primarily there because I've taken down my bear fence. I know that that's bad news. And I have to put a big disclaimer on this. I did that years ago. So I put these noisemakers all over my apiary. And uh, because here's what I've learned, uh, a black bear, and we have, I'm in black bear country where I live. And yes, I've been hit by a bear before. I've had bears eat sunflower seeds out of my feeders. So, um, and the electric fences, they just seem to have troubles. Like, of course, like anyone, I got the biggest, strongest electric fence uh, charger that I could get. And I put a uh, poultry fence out and everything else. But here's the thing, when it's raining or when the grass starts growing or anything that touches that fence, reduces the power that it has and it was a pain to clean around and mow around and you know all the other stuff so here's the thing uh i learned that black bears don't mind if a floodlight comes on so if they're coming around if you're one of these people that feeds your cat or your dog in the back porch or something and bears and raccoons come up and eat out of that porch light comes on they could care less some of these bears are conditioned to be around human structures so here's the thing. Um, they don't like noise, though. Bears have very good hearing. They don't have great eyesight. They have fantastic sense of smell. So they can smell an apiary. I, I've had that panicked feeling. You, you know, you're 100 feet from your apiary and you're smelling honey like it's right in front of you. So you're thinking that, wow, bears are going to know that there's an apiary here. But what they don't like is noise. So when these uh, motion activated alarms go off, um, Whenever they even go off on a mouse sometimes, depending on how it's situated, because you control the range and the sensitivity. So then when they go off, um, bears hear that before they're even in the vicinity of your apiary, and that's what you want. They hear this noise, it's unfamiliar, it stresses the bear. Uh, and I'll be honest, the game commission guys didn't even like that I was doing that. They said it stresses wildlife. So um, to have these noises going off in the middle of the night. And I definitely live out in the wild where I am. I'm on a dirt road. There's woods everywhere. There's, there's deer, there's game, there's, you know, everything you can name that's in the state of Pennsylvania comes right through here. Uh, but since I put those up, I haven't had a bear even show up on camera. And in social media, you know, something you've probably never heard of, it's called Facebook. Uh, everybody reports and shows pictures when bears are around. And they've stopped coming onto my property at all. So... My noisemakers are working. Now, two is one, one is none. So I count on them failing, which means I have 15 of them out there. That's right. So if you run through there for fun, you can get the whole thing squawking. They they beep for 15 minutes or 45 seconds minimum. So even if you flash through there, 45 seconds, they're going to run. Now, it's also a setback because the apiary is 100 feet from me right now. So at two in the morning, I often can hear them going off. So it's up to me. You know, do I want to go out there and see what's out there? But it's usually a raccoon or a skunk or a possum. Possums hate noise too. They run. I've never seen a possum move fast. I always thought they're just kind of moping around, but they take off pretty darn fast when the noise is. So they don't like the noise either. So I have no bears. I can't guarantee that's going to happen for you. But for me, no bears. Long story. That's what they're for. So the red plastic solar things, if you just go to go to Amazon and click on motion, to motion activated noisemakers, and uh, you'll see them. They're red. They have that angled plate on them. I've done videos about them in the past. And just look for the ones that have the highest dB ratings. And uh, that's it. They work. If you live in a neighborhood somewhere, you don't want them. They will, your neighbors will hate you. And let me tell you what, the flashing light does absolutely nothing. Deer walk through there, chewing stuff. They don't care. If it's just a flashing light with no noise, that does not deter a darn thing. So that's it. It keeps bears away. It works. If you want to do, by the way, some of you that might be looking into beekeeping and 
electric fences and things like that. One thing I would like to mention while we're all here, uh, go to University of Michigan and look at their bare fence studies. And they have the most thorough testing and evaluating of bare fence equipment. And then of course, how bears interact with it of any site that I found anywhere. So that's, I wanna say it's Michigan State University. Anyway, it won't be hard to find. Bear fencing, Michigan State, testing, results, blah, blah. You'll find it. It's good stuff. So this is from, oh, look, and Keith Spillman's here. So I have his question right in front of me. It says, great to see the ladies flying, but just like here, they are coming home hungry. I think this is, this year will be great and a test for Hive Alive fondant patties. I've had a few hives already burned through one two pounder. Folks need to be on top of things come late winter. So listen to Keith, everybody. He knows what he's talking about. And uh, because, by the way, I would have lost that colony if I didn't walk out there. Keith is half tracks and honeybees. So he's in the chat. If you want to talk to him, you can blame him for the fact that I'm mentioning Hive Alive again. These two pack, um, two pound packs are cool. See how thin that is? This year they came out with five pounds. So I have the five pounders. The one I put on that hive that was that was kind of losing it, you know, they were all dying because they were out of everything. I put a five pound on there. That makes me feel much better. So that's gonna work. So thank you, Keith. And how interesting that you're actually here in the chat while we're talking about that. So good stuff. And by the way, I get called out on the Hive Alive fondant packs frequently. There goes Fred again, selling Hive Alive. Well, it works. I would be negligent if I didn't tell you about this. I've never used fondant in the past because I'm not one of those people that can go in the kitchen and make up a bunch of fondant. I can't. I don't use winter patties. By the way, you want to price them? Winter patties were the other thing that I would probably look at because I'd rather buy it and put it in and know that it works. Hive Alive is a group that has a product. Their syrup is what the research was done on and validated. And it was for Nozema. So it's a company that I trust. They're from Ireland. And when they made these fondant packs, why not try them? Everybody got them the same year. The results are great. <coughs> Excuse me. That's it. That's it for tonight. I want to thank everybody for coming. Continue to make comments if you want to. Have a fantastic weekend.